everyone and welcome to the eighth episode of the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. I am Sara Vaormo and I'm hosting you today with Jussi Knutila. In this dialogue series we want to highlight solutions that other cities in Europe and globally also can utilize in their development. Every episode also features at least one of the previous European Green Capital winners, but today we are lucky to have two, two winners here. Uh, one of the quest uh, cities is Grenoble, the next year European Green Capital, and also Essen, the Green Capital from 2017. And also they are happening to be twin cities. Today's theme is climate change adaptation. And welcome everyone on my behalf as well. My name is Jussi Knuttila and I'm the second host tonight. You can participate the discussion, the panel discussion, by asking a question uh, in YouTube uh, in the chat. And um, we can start uh, activating the chat by asking the question, tell us where you are joining us from. So write in the chat where you are joining us from today. And before we jump to the panel discussion, I have some news. Uh, this month we have launched a new service, uh, the Lahti Sustainability Map. Uh, this is a thematic map for Lahti residents to look for sustainable solutions and nature sites in the area. And on this map you can find things such as electric car charging points, uh, community gardens and beautiful viewpoints and much, much more. And for our international viewers, now you can take a look and explore what the city has to offer in terms of sustainable solutions and also actors in the city. So link to the map is in the chat and uh, you can even explore the map uh, while we are having our discussion here. So take a look. And uh, but now, Sara, let's introduce our panelists. Look, oh, yeah, true. it's also um, reachable by mobile phone. So. I exactly. Like, I uh, yeah. Go and look some sites after this discussion. Yeah, both desktop and mobile. But let's go to our panelists now. So our first uh, guest comes from the city of Grenoble. I would like to introduce you with uh, Natalia Moyan. She's involved in the low carbon strategy of the Grenoble municipality. As a project manager, she implements uh, locally the EU Horizon 2020 project called Campaigners that aims to encourage uh, citizens to adopt climate-friendly lifestyles. Great to have you here. Welcome, Natalie. And the second guest today is Simon Raskob. Simon has been with the city of Essen since 2005 and uh, is the deputy mayor for environment, transport and sport. Uh, for the city of Essen, Simon was also the head of the European Green Capital Essen 2017 project. So, welcome to the discussion, Simon. Great to have you. Our third guest uh, is Heidi Tuhkanen. Heidi works as a senior expert at the Stockholm Environmental Institute Tallinn Center. Heidi's academic background is in urban sustainability. In addition to urban climate mitigation, adaptation and resilience, her work has also included the interaction between the private sector, society and the environment. Welcome to the show, Heidi. And our final guest today is Karin Bergqvist from PEAP. Karin works in PEAP industry, the business area within PEAP group that supplies construction materials, uh, for example, asphalt, concrete and aggregates. Karin's role involves taking out a strategic course and setting ambitious targets, as well as supporting, inspiring and sometimes perhaps challenging management and co-workers. So welcome to the show, Karin. Thank you. So let's look after a while where our audience is joining from, but going more towards um, the concept of today's talk, I yes. think. According to the scientist, climate change can no longer be completely stopped. And that's why we need to find ways to adapt also to it. Climate change causes threats and risks, for instance, flooding, drought and biodiversity loss. The consequences of climate change affect also our society and even our daily lives. 
we are all dependent on natural environment and ecosystem services that are a threat. And it's also a little bit giving hope to see all the news from the COP26, but still mm. we have so huge task ahead of us, I think. Yeah, yeah, true. And uh, climate change adaptation, it is at the core of the European Green Deal as well. The new uh, EU strategy on adaptation to climate change, it defines how the EU can adapt to the effects of climate change and uh, how the continent can uh, become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. So let's start maybe with some pictures and ideas. We would like to now hear from our panelists. Could you name like one adaptation challenge that your city is facing or maybe some kind of concrete example of climate change adaptation actions that you or your organization or city has already been implementing? So maybe starting with the guest cities, I would take Simone at first. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to your wonderful Green Capital Year in uh, 2000. 21 and um, and um, uh, I would like to answer your question. Um, Essen has two main challenges in adaptation in adapting to climate change. First, increasing heat stress in dense urban areas accompanied by extreme drought. The second main challenge is the risk of flooding and the result of heavy rain situations event also in this year. So these two points are very important um, also for the city of Essen. And our main measure is uh, against these two problems are the creation of green and blue infrastructure. Um, and uh, this helps us uh, to uh, react to this um, uh, challenge. So first um, we start also with the green roof um, for all citizens, constructions of infiltration tren trenches for uh, urban trees and we create uh, new interconnected green spaces and a rainwater decoupling and unsealing system. Mm, sounds good. And I had a pleasure to visit also Essen twice during your Green Capital year. Yeah. And what a difference you've made there uh, with the last 10 or 20 years. I think yeah. a lot has happened. And let's go deeper into that soon. But uh, first, maybe um, Natalie, could you tell us um, some examples of challenges or either actions that you've already done? They're incredible. Yes, thank you for the invitation too. Uh, as Essen, we also work a lot on the green and blue infrastructure. And um, maybe I can show you just quickly um, a picture. Up here, can you see it? Yes. yes. Yeah, so for, for the first year in Grenoble, um, this last summer, we deploy uh, uh, temporary facilities uh, to have these foggy, fog-like systems in all the neighbors, or almost in, in all the neighborhoods in Grenoble, uh, to fight against these heat waves that are really a big issue uh, here in Grenoble. And, um, and it's really the, the good... Um, yeah, I think the good facility uh, because it's also a playful, um, playful system for children in the in the in the city, and it's really uh, on the comfort uh, and um, and and it it uh, it makes the public spaces uh, comfortable. Uh, even if the heat waves are very strong uh, in Grenoble. And uh, that was the first summer that we deploy this uh, temporary uh, uh, facilities uh, because um, uh, all the time we we work on on uh, big, the deployment of of fountains and uh, that that can allow you to really be in contact with the water and uh, because it's really 
the being in contact uh, with the water that makes the freshness uh, efficient and, uh, and and in a traditional fountain uh, it's not for healthy reasons it's not uh, the good the good system uh, to be in contact with the water so it, it's also a big uh, challenge to um, to to work on this uh, infrastructures of water in the city and uh, and deploy also temporary uh, fountains and the associations local association can uh, also borrow these uh, small systems and uh, during events so they they can uh, use it uh, when when they want and and where it's it's the more efficient oh that's wonderful okay i love these pictures it's <laughs> nice that you work with kids super nice thanks Thank a you, lot Natalie. and then next um we'll take a karin yes yeah Yes, um, as a construction company, of course, we need to adapt our solutions to society's needs and uh, we can certainly help build these constructions that are needed to handle climate change. Uh, we can develop our materials uh, to better cope with future climate. Um, but we also need to think about what we, what we decide to build because that's usually not our choice. Uh, so I just wanted to share some thoughts about that. Um, I hope you see my screen now. Yes, we'll see. Uh, the first photo is from a park in Malmö after the storm called Sven, very Swedish name. Uh, Malmö was just centimeters from having uh, the brand new underground city tunnel flooded. So it wasn't even designed to, to handle today's storms. Um, to the right, uh, and uh, about this solution, you can say that it's a, obviously a temporary panic solution and uh, necessary, of course, but maybe not so aesthetic and surprisingly expensive as well. And to the right, instead, a suggestion where um, they make the park itself into, uh, or make it part of the flooding protection in itself. And down to the left is uh, uh, New Orleans after uh, Katrina, where we see uh, the wall that's hopefully going to stop the next storm or at least uh, reduce the impact. And to the right, we have uh, Manhattan, New York, and a suggestion for how to reduce risk. And this was after uh, the storm Sandy. And uh, there they have this initiative called Rebuild by Design. Uh, where they uh, gather government, business uh, organizations and so on to discuss how to handle risks. And they are looking into uh, using nature's own uh, solutions like uh, restoring wetlands and so on. So I'm thinking in this that uh, construction companies like PIAV and municipalities can, can join in and work together with this because the municipalities can, um, can provide platforms uh, where we can uh, test uh, innovative solutions and so on to not handle uh, the effects uh, in this way, like in Malmö, for example, but to ex uh, actually create these uh, resilient and, and attractive cities. So that was my thoughts about this. Very good examples of different kind of solutions. Let's go deeper into the role of construction sector with you. It's great to have you have you on board, on board. But Thank you. first, um, Heidi, what kind of yeah. actions or challenges would you name? Yeah. No, I'm having a hard time. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Yes, great. So uh, I live in Helsinki. And, um, and Helsinki is actually, and I'm involved in a project called Be Green, which is uh, funded by, by Interreg, Interreg Central Baltic. And uh, Helsinki is actually um, developing some of its new, or doing new developments in this brownfield, um, brownfield areas to meet actually the growing housing demands, as well as making them more uh, low carbon. And in order to, uh, in addition to doing that, they're also working on adaptation 
Uh, as you can see from the two pictures that I put from Kala Satama, which is one of these new areas, that I think is using, trying to use its city planning um, and city zoning as tools to increase the nature-based solutions and the use of green infrastructure, which these other speakers also talked about into its um, planning of these new method, new areas so that they can face the future um, climate change challenges. And in this area, you can see, for example, on the left, you see the green the green roofs that um, are quite visible on top of these buildings, and they've been put into some of the plans as requirements um, for the courtyards and also the buildings, the housing buildings. And then on the right-hand side, you see an area um, which is the northern part of Kalasatama, where there's actually a flood park um, which can be used for recreation in normal times, but then also can be um, used to capture some of that flooding from sea level, sea level rise or storms, storm surge. And then also these um, the uh, integrated stormwater management systems are planned to go through these housing developments actually into this green area so that they start, start this planning in the very built areas and then um, come out to the to the green areas. So that's one of the exciting things that Helsinki is doing. And it's also trying to transfer these lessons learned from these new areas also into these some of these older areas for retrofitting so that they can also be climate resilient. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Super interesting. Good, good example from Helsinki. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, yes, now we're moving back to uh, Grenoble. Uh, but first, uh, if our viewers, if you have any examples from your city, you can uh, write uh, that in the uh, chat. So tell us about your example, how to uh, combat uh, climate change. It seems uh, that we are having people at least from different cities of Finland yes. joining, so please comment also yes. there. Very good. So um, Grenoble has had a strong commitment to climate change adaptation and the city was the first in France to adopt a climate plan in 2005. And uh, this uh, climate plan succeeded in reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 25% from 2005 to 2016. And the plan has now been updated and with it uh, the city is working towards a 50% reduction by uh, 2030, and lastly, towards being carbon neutral in 20, uh, 2050. So, Nathalie, uh, what are the ways and actions the city plans to adapt to climate change in the uh, upcoming decades? Yes, maybe first of all, it's really uh, about the um, fight against the urban heat highland effect uh, that, that um, yeah, we, we deploy quite a lot of actions uh, to fight against against that that um, effect, um, and especially uh, with water facilities, uh, so we deploy a lot of um, uh, water efficient solutions uh, using fogging fog like uh, systems. Uh, we adapt our fountains to allow people to to be in contact with the water. Uh, we also increase the numbers of stand pipes. Uh, to for drinking water that's really common but to to refresh it's quite efficient I just drink water um, and um, and we on the new public spaces on new parks or the renovation of, of uh, urban parks we also um, uh, build real freshness areas uh, so with all these this, uh, solutions with water uh, to play and uh, and to just be comfortable outside uh, even during summer because we know that a lot of people they are at home uh, and and they can't well it's not it's not the good solution to have air conditioned everywhere so it's our idea is really to make public spaces um, welcoming and uh, and and for instance the last years uh, the big problem uh, that popped up was the, um, uh, the too much people on these comfortable areas outside. We, we get this problem of, uh, of yeah, too, too much people uh, around the fountains, on the parks. So we really work on the deployment of 
the systems everywhere in the cities. During so it's the, all about... During the heat waves, how hot can it be in, in Krenobyl? Can you uh, some numbers? It's be around 40, but you know, the issue but. is much more that, that um, because we are on mountain area, but we are only 200 meters high, so it's, and the city is very flat, so we have mountains everywhere, but our issues uh, within the global warming is not issues of mountain areas uh, properly. And um, so you, you have the heat that stays in the, in the city. And uh, the big issue is the heat during the night. And also on the buildings, we also work, for instance, on the schools. Uh, when we do renovation, it's, it's every time about energy efficiency. Uh, but we also integrate the comfort aspect for the summer. And um, yeah, a very concrete example is to we replace windows uh, when it's possible by systems that you can stay that you can let open during the night to improve and to 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 take benefit of the refreshing uh, the refreshment during the night. And it's all this cooling. Uh, passive cooling systems that we deploy also on the buildings uh, when we when we do renovation of the, the municipal uh, infrastructures. You talk, we remove you talk about the, the Alps already a bit, but I would like to ask what kind of changes have been happening there in the Alps? Can you see some climate change effects to the ecosystems already there? How is it? Yeah, at the metropol at the metropolitan scale, uh, uh, for instance, yeah, we have these mountains, and we we can see that the forests are uh, drier, uh, and we have this risk of um, fire fire in the in the forest that increase uh, during the summer, and um, and we have the quite a lot of uh, the yeah beginning of. Um, uh, discussions about the usage of water also even we have quite a lot of water in mountain area uh, the, the, the availability of the water and the usage are yeah become a, become a problem but in Grenoble it's really much more about removal the concrete surfaces and increase the of course uh, the vegetalized uh, the vegetalization of public spaces and also on private spaces. For instance, we we did the donation of trees uh, to to improve the planting of trees even on the on the private uh, for the private owners uh, in the city. So we know that it's uh, yeah water and vegetalization are really the key the key uh, the, the key uh, of the success to fight. Uh, I get, and then to get this adaptation uh, of the city. But for the mountains, we don't have uh, mountains that high, that we, we don't have a lot of uh, glacier. Or, but um, yeah, we are depending on the, the water from the mountains, so it's a big issue for the city. Some, some really good and concrete examples. Um, in the adaptation measures from Grenoble. And um, I want to mention in the end, as uh, Lahti, we are reaching the end of our green capital year and uh, yours starts very soon. So um, what kind of expectations and hopes do you have for the year? Uh, short answer. Yeah, for the, our year, we really have on the, on the target to have these uh, challenges. And we would like that all the metropolitan area of Grenoble uh, involve uh, the citizens, but also the enterprises and all the administration companies and so on, uh, on challenges uh, on several uh, uh, thematics. And uh, so it's not only events, but really uh, start concrete uh, actions uh, so that can yeah, occurred during the year, but uh, uh, longer too. Yeah, and what what better time to kickstart projects than during the green capital year? So yeah, sounds sounds very good. We're li really looking forward to what's what's gonna come. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you. 
Essen used to be one of Germany's most important coal center and is the first mining city to win the title of the European Green Capital. Simon, Essen has overcome its challenging industrial past and reinvented itself as a green city. That also reminds our city a little bit, I think. Yeah. What are the city's plans to adapt to the climate change? Could you name a few? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, we discuss in our city council um, the adaption strategy, and um, this um, implements more than 60 measures for the adaption strategy. But I would like to uh, emphasize that, that it's also important that we reduce our greenhouse gas emission. Uh, so both is very important to make it at the same time, like a double strategy. And um, it's uh, the same discussion like in uh, Grenoble. We have a political decision that um, Essen's CO2 budget is consumed between 2035 and 2040. And these are only 15, perhaps 70, 18 years uh, that Essen's CO2 budget is uh, consumed. So um, uh, it's a lot of more, it's more pressure on um, our administration and also from Friday of Future uh, and the discussion with all these people that we must um, must be get, uh, we must be quicker with our, the, our measures. We need more money, more stuff to make it now and not in 15 years. Mm. And we have the same discussion in Berlin. We have a new um, government discussion in Berlin and uh, the Green Party will also be a part of this. We hope it, uh, it will be finished until um, Christmas time. So I think it's uh, very important uh, the next five years, perhaps 10 years, that uh, we make a lot more than we did perhaps until our green capital year in 2017. Mm. So I think the time for our topics, for our goals, is the best time we ever had. Uh, and I think it's not only in Germany, it's also in Europe. When you see the Green Deal from Mrs. van der Leyen and all the money uh, you will get from Europe in the future, you only will get it when you make um, climate change climate adaptation um, uh, measures. So I think uh, it's a good time for our projects. Um, and so it's uh, very important that all parties in Essen, but also in Germany now, uh, start to run. Mm. And therefore, we will also get money for adaptation, I hope so, in the next year. Um, we uh, have budget uh, discussion in our city council at the end of November, so we will get more stuff. Uh, for example, for bicycle, 28 new uh, people who can uh, work for bicycle topics. It was never in the city, and we will get also 230 million euros for the next nine years only to build bicycle mm -hmm. infrastructure. Sounds so I good. think. We will get also more money for adaptation because uh, we had a lot of, uh, we had a big flood in Germany in the middle of July, mm. also in Essen. Um, and um, it, we get here in Nordrhein Westfalen 12 billion euro to build up the houses, to build up the infrastructure for traffic, um, for, the, uh, for sport. Uh, locations because uh, on the River Ruhr all the sport um, places were destroyed and uh, so they feel now that uh, we get every year ex uh, weather extreme events and they know now it costs a lot of money more when you don't do it now because when you do it later it costs a lot of more money mm -hmm. and this is very important that we can also say uh, what is the economic uh, value for adaptation um, measures, but also what you can save when you not must reconstruct the destroyed infrastructure.
strong message is that um, you, you have an interesting background, uh, your city um, with a coal, coal mining industry. So could you maybe briefly tell about the, the energy solutions that you've now utilized to maybe also similarly mitigate and adapt to the climate change? So, so what kind of energy solutions you have been taking there? Yeah, we know in, uh, it's very important that we use the potential of renewable energies. And in Essen, it's a dense urban area in the metropolis Ruhr. The most important is to make PV, also photovoltaic, um, on, on the roofs. But also, at the same time, you make green roofs. And this is not uh, a difference. It's not a um, contrast. Because uh, in the past time, the people said you can make uh, PVs or you make green roofs, but you can make it together and you must do it together. Because when we have 40 degrees uh, in the last years, in August, many days in Essen, in the center of the city, then the PVs doesn't work anymore because it's too hot for them. So when you know that green and roofs and uh, um, you need also to, to that the renewable energy potential you, is very high, then you can combine these systems. And um, I think it's very in, uh, necessary to think the systems together, not only in one sector. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Simon. That was, that was clear. Thanks. And Heidi, you work as a senior expert at Stockholm Environment Institute in Tallinn Center. Um, Heidi's expertise lies on the local level and urban sustainability, social equity, but also disaster risk reduction. Um, Heidi, we have now heard about uh, climate change adaptation in two European cities. However, most of the global south is extremely more vulnerable to climate change than the north. So uh, how do we ensure that climate adaptation is considered at a global level? Thanks. This is a, actually a really timely question, I think, considering the COP discussions. And I think this uh, was taken up by many speakers already this week. So climate adaptation is a little bit more of a local issue um, than mitigation. But as uh, Simone was saying, that they're very, they're very connected, especially when you look at the global impacts. The more that we are doing mitigation efforts, especially in the global north, uh, means that the less adaptation that needs to be done globally uh, in the future. And but one of the things is that adaptation needs funding. And one of the things that they've they've highlighted at COP is that uh, the funding, the hundred billion that was pledged in 2009 at the COP, um, has come short each each year. So this was a uh, hundred billion annually funding that should be um, transferred from the global north to the or the developing developed countries to the developing countries to help them um, adapt. And this is this is something that now hopefully there has been some some more some more support from leaders um, to make sure that that funding actually does come through. Um, so I think that's that's one of the ways that uh, we can ensure that uh, adaptation takes place in you know, around the world. Thank you for the insights and thank you for the news from, from COP as well. Yeah, yeah. But some climate impacts are not as severe uh, in the European North compared to the rest of the world. How do we risk, risk awareness in places that do not face sudden extreme risks, maybe that, not that often at least, or at first even might be experiencing some benefits due to the climate change? So. What to do for that? Yeah, well, I think that um, some of these, maybe we focus on risks that are a certain specific risks. There's obviously more extreme examples in the global south, but I think we've already seen um, in Europe, even in the last years, that they we have also come across a lot of these same or similar or as extreme hazards, maybe not as often as those um, in more developing countries or in the global south. But also these risks are not only just coming from local, locally um, occurring hazards, they're also coming from uh, our very connected global world. 
Uh, we saw with COVID-19 how shocks around the world, shocks in totally another place, can have um, very local impacts uh, in Europe and in in Northern Europe. And so these these kinds of risks are called the transboundary climate risks, and they come in through the flows of of people. Uh, there's climate migration, and people move when they're affected by shocks. Uh, this also affects us. Um, it's also affected by flows of finances uh, and goods. This can affect, affect our food systems. We're dependent on many different places for the things that we use for our supply chains and the things that we eat. And, and also the financial system, those things affect the, you know, the supplies of those commodities, affect the, affect the prices of those commodities for us. So I think that the world is really interconnected and we need to be recognizing that, um, that interconnectedness. We shouldn't be too comfortable here, but to understand no. the global impacts. Thanks a lot, Heidi. Thank you so much. Um, Karin, you work as the sustainability strategist at PEAP Industry uh, Infrastructure Construction, plays a central role in emissions in the cities and PEAP's eco-concepts are now being launched across the Nordic countries. Karin, could you tell us a bit more about eco-asphalt, what it actually is? Um, the construction industry is not often considered as a sustainable actor. How do you see this? Uh, no, that's true. We, we have issues to, to handle in the construction industry. Um, we have high emissions, we use natural resources and we do also generate waste. So we are really on to these issues now and a lot of things uh, is happening. Uh, but it's about climate improvement and it's about going from linear to circular, uh, to just put it simple. Um, we are launching these eco concepts um, and eco asphalt is uh, um, um, something that we launched in uh, in Sweden in 2015 and that has now this year uh, reached also Norway, Denmark and Finland, where Lati has seen the first um, asphalt plan to offer eco asphalt. And what it's about, it's... Uh, um, we replace the fuel, the fossil fuel in the plants uh, with biofuels. And since asphalt requires very high temperatures uh, in production, uh, this measure alone is uh, reducing uh, climate impact by 50%. That's five, zero percent. And uh, so this is where we start, of course, uh, uh, with the highest impact for each of our eco concepts. We work in Sweden also with Eco concrete and eco aggregates, uh, where aggregate is not a high climate um, product, but it's about them saving natural resources. So we are replacing uh, virgin extracted um, stone and gravel and sand with recycled materials from, from construction projects and, and industrial uh, byproducts as, as well. Um, but what is important is also that. Um, even if we start with the largest impact for each eco concept, it doesn't it doesn't end there. We uh, we work to continuously uh, reduce the total environmental impact from a life cycle perspective. So we ad address how it's transported and energy efficiency, um, recycling. Where we today recycle a lot of the asphalt uh, into new asphalt, which is of course a very efficient way in in uh, both in terms of climate and um, saving nature resources. And we are working even on uh, research for uh, replacing the binder in asphalt, which is uh, based today on, on uh, fossil oil. Um, and we are looking into uh, waste products from the forest industry where we use uh, lignin, which is the natural binder in, in wood. Um, so that's very exciting. We have very positive laboratory, res uh, laboratory results and we have just uh, uh, also made the first pilot uh, or a field projects um, in Sweden, where we will be following this. Uh, so the ECO concepts is about uh, all the time improving the projects uh, or the products. Uh, it's also about using uh, in byproducts and making it more circular where we have, we see that we can work together with indus industries that also want to find good use for their waste or byproducts. So that's a very uh, much a win-win situation where we also get them the, the circular raw materials to use in our products. And 
what is also important is uh, to keep high standards in these eco concepts. So we have set up criteria to say that um, an eco product from PEAB should uh, uh, represent a large improvement, uh, a, a considerable uh, environmental improvement. And this improvement needs to be verified. So we, we uh, offer uh, data to customers to see really what improvement we have done. And it's, it's verified, uh, um, for example, by climate calculations that we can provide per project um, for the customer. And uh, we also work uh, in some places with EPDs, environmental product declarations. So that's very important for us to have uh, transparency and trustworthiness in these eco-concepts to, to keep the high standards. Mm -hmm. Yes, I fully agree. And Karin, we have heard about uh, eco-asphalt. Uh, could you maybe tease what is PEAP's next innovative solution after eco-asphalt? What's coming up uh, next? Yes, it's as I said, these eco-concepts will never be uh, um, finished. We are still <laughs> working on them. And uh, what I think is interesting is these kind of uh, um, collaborations with industries with other sectors where we can both learn from them and also uh, use their byproducts. So that's something that we uh, uh, we need to uh, improve in in taking care of our own waste products also in the building industry and recycle them. Uh, and that's, there's happening a, a lot in that area now. But it's very interesting also, also to find these industrial byproducts, with, which we use also in the concrete. Uh, in eco concrete, we can reduce uh, carbon emissions by up to 50%. Uh, and also um, often improve the technical functionality by using uh, slag, which is a byproduct from steel industry. So this is very, this is more of an innovative solution because this is new for us. Uh, we have this lignine in the asphalt, and we have also um, different byproducts from industrial processes that we can make into good aggregates. And what is really interesting also is that. Uh, uh, we, we show with these eco concepts that we don't need to compromise on quality or, or technical properties or performance um, when doing these environmental uh, improvements. We, we have both because we make sure that it doesn't, uh, that we maintain or even improve the, the quality of the product because our, our customers are, are buying a function, first of all. So, uh, and we also will, will not do ourselves a favor if we present eco products and they prove to be of lower quality or some other um, aspects. So uh, that's a very um, much in focus for these eco products. And we are showing with um, what we are presenting to the market that uh, you don't need to choose. You can have you can have it both ways. Right. It seems that a lot of innovations will happen there in the construction sector. Could you just briefly maybe Karin still explain us uh, your um, sort of your idea about the role of construction sector uh, companies um, in helping cities to adapt to climate change. So what do yeah. you think? What, what are your role in there? Well, we, we, we need to supply the sustainable solutions. That's, uh, I mean, a sustainability for us uh, is, is about um, securing long-term competitiveness, but also uh, our relevance on the market. And that come, goes for customers and employees and society as a, as a whole. Uh, but the good thing is that um, we also contribute great value to society, of course. Everything we see around us, we, we have built. And uh, also, this, uh, this actually makes us today uh, increasingly attractive to people, not the least young people, who want to be part of, of to, in driving sustainable change. Because we have so much going on in our industry, and uh, we also provide a, an environment where we, they can, uh, we, we can see very concrete results. And we, uh, what we are putting out in society has a very, it's very present in everyone's daily life. Um, so these things ha help us to attract uh, the right competence and skills to, to our business and uh, new perspectives and um, that we need to to move um, so it's a very exciting place to to be right now and mm -hmm. we do have challenges as we say um, and I, I would also since we have cities and uh, municipalities represented here it's the, uh, we see also public 
procurement as uh, can play a really important role in in driving us and other business forward and this to to drive change by by uh, putting high requirements uh, relevant requirements uh, preferably uh, but also make sure to to follow up and uh, um, have it validated so that we uh, we promise to achieve um, a certain co2 level in a material for example we need to prove that we that we did this so we will so that we will have fair competition in the business but i think public procurement and uh, um, also adapting regulations and so on to open up because as people have said here already we really need to speed up things today and in sweden we have re research that showed that uh, uh, we can reduce uh, climate impact from construction by 50 percent by 2030 by using existing te technology and and known uh, solutions uh, so we just need to do that now and uh, make sure that the whole value chains chain is working with it that the market is open to new new ideas because we need to also leave our comfort zone a bit both from our side and from the market side so we need to see that these investments we are doing that it's um, that is valued on the market a lot of to, scalable to solutions there karin thanks a lot for for this valuable feedback Thank you. We also got actually a um, question there uh, from the audience, but let's take a very, very uh, quick round. Um, yeah, one of the, the listeners are asking, are the cities that prepare themselves now for the effects of climate change the winners in the future? In the sense of well-being, economic su success, etc. I would like to hear thoughts on this, but maybe let's be also pragmatic, so where do you see it, sort of the economic growth or well-being? So be, please be very, very brief because uh, we want to have all your uh, ideas as well. And let's start with uh, Simon. So what do you think? Yes, I think uh, Grenoble and other green cities in Europe are winner cities. That's the first, because they start very early to think about their future and what are their goals for the next 10, 15 years. So I think all the cities who started very early for the transform transformation of the cities, uh, they will be um, winner cities. And uh, I think the inhabitants uh, in the cities, they are very um, they are very engaged now and they, are, they feel that the political level is too um, not fast enough. So uh, we must uh, find a way in the administration to bring the measures on the street and um, don't discuss uh, 20 years about um, CO2 neutrality in uh, 2045 or in 2050. They want to know what we must do now and they will that we, re that we act now. And uh, therefore cities who start early and have a good adaptation strategy, a good um, mitigation strategy, who are very uh, near to the inhabitants, to the NGOs. I think there will be the winner cities for the future because you cannot make it alone. You need the inhabitants and you need the stakeholders. And um, so it's um, a big challenge. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much. And then Heidi. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Simone said. She talked about um, stakeholders, and I think that that is one of the big challenges in moving forward is getting the stakeholders, the right stakeholders to the table and at the right time early enough. Often the planning processes in the city are done very are done in parallel in a way, or one, one, one department or organization is finished, then it moves to another department or organization. But actually in creating these cities um, to be sustainable for the future, we, we actually need to be talking between stakeholders already in the very initial planning stages to know, to make sure that we do have um, the, the right competences at the right time and enough space and everything like that. And it's the private sector in many forms needs to be involved in that, as well as the citizens. Yeah, Natalie. 
Yes, I, like I think for for Grenoble, and it's also a, a, a main uh, factor of success is to show that um, all these measures are an improvement of the quality of life of everyday life for the inhabitants, and it's also thinking uh, about the future, but it's just uh, improve your daily life uh, with this new commodities, new facilities. So it's really a key, a key uh, a world to have um, to to share this vision also to uh, to to everybody. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And Karin. Yes, interesting to hear this because I'm thinking that cities and municipalities, they you are also brands. Uh, right to attract uh, business and citizens and and so on so it's interesting uh, I'm thinking that of course when we hear about all these things that need to be built and and, and uh, in existing infrastructure that need to be upgraded and so on uh, that that means economic boost and business for <laughs> and other construction companies might might sound a bit provocative here but of course it's like that but it also requires that we are uh, that we develop sustainable uh, solutions to these um, challenges and uh, I think it's uh, um, and to put it in a wider perspective it's uh, all big change will need will mean um, opportunities for those who are able to adapt and act on them in a good way uh, while others might go out of business and we will see both companies and maybe whole industries uh, going that way uh, when we need when we do this change of our society so um, but we already see green sectors that create more jobs than are being lost in the fossil sectors and so on. So I'm sure that there will be more winners than losers. And everyone here, uh, I'm sure, want to be part of the winners, right? Yeah, I think and so. And we need each Definitely. other for that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, we're reaching the end. Maybe uh, since we now have, have the twin cities of Grenoble and Essen here, um, yeah, the Green Capital Year, it, it, it really is a year to uh, show, show and share the knowledge and best practices uh, with other cities. So uh, briefly, what is the cooperation uh, like with the twin cities, uh, Essen and Grenoble during the Green Capital Year? Can you uh, tease about the upcoming Green Capital Year or tell us more about the cooperation? Maybe Natalie, you can, uh, or Simon, yes. Uh, Natalie is first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, just, yeah, briefly, uh, I think it's, it's good to say that uh, we used to have regular uh, um, cooperation with SN uh, before this uh, European Green Capital application and uh, on technical aspects, but also on, on a political level. And uh, we regularly have delegation from SN uh, that comes to visit us uh, for study visits or for during the biennial of the cities in transition, which is our main event here uh, about transition uh, solutions. And uh, so we had this uh, this uh, cooperations uh, and uh, with the the European Green Capital uh, application that really improves. Uh, the, the the cooperation and, uh, and they help us quite a lot uh, during the writing of the the report uh, for the application, but also to prepare uh, the Meyer and all our delegation for the final oral uh, exam. And that was very helpful. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was a very good point for us. Sounds good. What about Simon? Uh, yes, I think it's also very nice to see that our two mayors um, uh, work very good together. Yeah, so it's not normal that they're on the same age, um, that they have nearly the same political style. They had the, the same problem with the uh, election in last year and they both won mm -hmm. um, the election. So it's very fine to see how these two cities um, um, develop in the green uh, topics. And uh, I would like to invite you to see Grenoble in our International European Future Format Congress in December. We started in 2017 with the um, 
Declaration of Essen that we make all two years this conference. And the next is on the 7th of December. You are all invited. Grenoble will be there to present the program for the next year. I'm also very, uh, I don't know what they will present, but I'm sure it will be very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can take part also hybrid. And uh, it's also in uh, in be uh, interpreted bilingual in German and English. So if you have time, uh, you can um, make your um, reservation for this um, since the end of last week. So we would be happy if the network of the green cities take part also when you cannot be here. So, uh, but perhaps you are hybrid here and then you can see Grenoble and also my mayor and the persons from Grenoble and our minister of minister of environment is also there and it's a very high level um, conference. Very Thanks promising. So. Thank indeed. you for the invitation. Thanks yeah. a lot. And since we have uh, five minutes left in mm -hmm. the show, I think we're going to go for the myths and uh, yeah. claims. So yeah, the last part, as our viewers know, is about uh, myths, claims and misconceptions and this time uh, about climate change adaptation. So, uh, panelists, you may agree or disagree and just give a short reasoning why you agree or disagree. Only one sentence is allowed. Very good, one sentence. And the first myth goes to Natalie. Uh, climate change adaptation mainly means technical solutions like flood walls and urban runoff infrastructure. Yes, I don't agree. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one one um, idea on, on that, uh, it's really also uh, something about organization. And so you can work on the working hours, for instance, for our civil servants that work outside. We adapt uh, the, the, the planning when it's during the heat waves. Uh, and yeah, we open the parks during the night and we get free access to museum because it's air conditioned. Oh, yep. <laughs> Thanks very good. Thank you. <laughs> Simon, adapting to climate change is not only about preparing for risks, but also about sizing possible benefits. Uh, I hope I understand your question, but um... Uh, benefits, you mean in econo economic uh, benefits? I mean, just uh, if you disagree or agree with this, it can be economic or social or environmental. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question correct. Um, perhaps you start a new one. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, it's a question about do you see some kind of also some kind of benefits there in, in Essen when thinking about changing climate? Are there yes, any? yes, of course. Uh, when um, in the summertime, um, when you have a lot more green spaces and a lot of more water, you can see the benefit um, about temperature that goes down, um, that the trees are not uh, dying anymore so you can see the benefit of course and the people see it every year and when they see the flood in Essen then they know that it's a little bit too late uh, yeah in <laughs> Essen. exactly yeah mm -hmm. so yeah uh, that's good answer yeah. yeah it's it's both very often yeah exactly and Heidi uh, only coastal cities and cities located at other vulnerable areas must carry out climate change adaptation actions so I disagree with this. I think that um, climate change is not just about location or that would be exposure, but it is about also about the vulnerability of your society. And that looks at your infrastructure. It looks like it looks at the demographics of your society. It looks at like the inequalities. So all those things need to be considered in the planning. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Karin, climate change adaptation measures can also boost economic activities. Absolutely. <laughs> I already touched this on the previous comments. So uh, yes, then instead, I take the chance to say that uh, we would much more like to compete uh, for most sustainable solution in a wide perspective rather than lowest price, which is very often the, the, the driver in, uh, in our project today. L low price, uh, low cost uh, and short time uh, to build. 
So we need to value what kind of resources we need to be careful with. Is it time or is it climate um, and so on? So and, and what is the real cost with something that Simone was also touching? What is the real cost and the real value um, when we build things? And, and how, how do we measure that? In a longer so, uh, term, yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Karin. Thank you. And whoa, yeah. So this was the eighth episode of European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. What an episode. What did we learn? Quite a lot. Um, actually, we had yesterday the Eco City Forum, Lahti, um, now hearing all these news from COP26 and now today's talk about climate change adaptation. It's all over. We talk about climate change nowadays every day, I think. Um, it was good to concentrate on adaptation side as well. I think cities are doing right a lot, but we still have a lot to do, I think. Uh, even the last summer here was extremely hot and it surprised us completely, so, yeah. Yeah, and it's November and still no snow, so, mm, true. yeah. Yeah, what I got from this is that, uh, yeah, we need to speed up the process, both adaptation and mitigation, and that's why the whole world is collect, um, collected now in Glasgow, so yeah. it's going to be very interesting days ahead. High hopes for that. Exactly. All right, and... Uh, Next month, uh, on, on Friday the 1st of December, uh, sorry, Wednesday the 1st of uh, December, we have our last episode. So it has been nine episodes this year of European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities, so stay tuned. We are going to, going to talk about sustainable land use in the final episode. Thank you very much, our great panelists and also our viewers joining us today. See you next time and the last time. This is the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. Hi. Moi moi. Bye bye.